therapists, what has been your most intense session? I worked in child and adolescent crisis before my current job, I could tell a lot of stories, but the one that still really sticks with me is this. If you're not familiar with crisis units in the hospital, they have CCTV, so security guards can watch multiple patients simultaneously to monitor behavior for safety. I'm working a crisis case of a 12YO male after a few years at the same hospital. The child had been aggressive towards staff, broke a crisis worker's nose, so he'd been put in four-point restraints. Don't even get me started on that human rights violation. One of the guards comes to me and says, I think you need to see this. He pulls up a screen recording, and there's a video of mom putting her hand down the child's pants, gesticulating her hand inside his pants, then pulling her hand back out after a few strokes, and then, a few minutes later, the same thing. I call CPS. They come down. Watch the videos. I call his long-term mental health therapist and say, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we saw mom molesting child on video. Therapist screams I knew it. I knew she was molesting him. We call dad down, who hasn't been in the kid's life much. He says he got chased away by mom for a lot of reasons, but one of them was that he got creeped out by things mom would say and do. For instance, mom allegedly told him she was attracted to girlish looking boys with long hair, which just about summed up the child. Mom is asked about the incidents, and says that she wasn't molesting the child. Says that the child has a tick and needs his balls moved sometimes, to stop the tick. He couldn't get the tick himself, because of being in restraints, so she just did it for him. Twice. CPS found that an acceptable excuse, and ruled the case unfounded. I don't know what was worse, watching the videos or hearing, that CPS watched the same videos as me, and said yeah that's okay. Not a therapist, but social worker who works with traumatized children. We got this underaged girl who was raised by a mother suffering of Munchausen by proxy syndrome which essentially means the mother pretends that her child is sick to get attention and the pity of people. This goes as far as poisoning her own child or even mutilated to have a reason to seek doctors. The mother in question was incredibly abusive, even when her daughter got taken away from her. For some reason officials never took child custody from her which made it easy to have influence on her daughter's live. She specifically used it to tell her daughter that she loved her and she will always be there for her. But every time things actually happened and she needed to be there, she wasn't. One day her daughter got pregnant, but the child died within a few days, so an abortion needed to be done ASAP to prevent pregnancy poisoning. All she needed to do was granting permission by email, but although I called her several times and she assured me she would send it, it just never came. Her daughter was forced to have her dead unborn child in her womb for 3 days for the sole reason that her mother just didn't do anything. We finally reached out to CPS and got permission through them, but her daughter was deeply traumatized by this and just never recovered from it. Seeing her like this was my first I need a minute moment. Not a therapist, but I used to be a school social worker. We had two students who were murdered by their dad. The next day a student told me that she knew they were being abused but didn't tell a single person, so she broke down in my office, blamed herself for them getting murdered, because she didn't tell anyone they told her they were getting abused. The next day this student had a suicide attempt, the next week the schools shut down, because of covid, I attempted to follow up with her remote and checked in, but a month into the schools, being closed I lost contact with this student. I still think of her every day and hope she's doing alright. I would say my therapist moment was when a 10 year old child described to me in vivid detail how his mom's boyfriend locked him in a dog kennel and brutally stabbed his mom to death right in front of him took her body to the woods and threatened to kill him if he told someone. I still see this client and I work on helping him work through the grief and emotion processing as well as building coping skills. He's still super young, but I worry that he's going to get some unhealthy coping skills to cope with this trauma. First internship on my path to counselor, and I was working in funeral home under the grief counselor there. Grief and trauma is my focus. We were taught to be strong and supportive to those grieving of course, and if we needed to cry, go in the back or to the bathroom. I escorted her elderly lady to view her husband before the service. I helped sit her in the chair in front of the casket and was standing behind her when she stood up and laid on the casket, bawling her eyes out declaring 
how much she loved him, missed him, and begging him not to leave her, come back, that totally destroyed me. I immediately started crying behind her, she stood up, and I sucked it up, to help her walk back into the hall to start greeting guest, I thought I had, did a good job collecting myself, but my mentor took one look at me and softly said, go to the back room, which I did, I completely lost it for a few minutes, cleaned up and went back to help with the service. I definitely needed that minute. When I was a mental health professional in a big city jail for years, I had a few moments where I needed to take an extended bathroom break to compose myself. Breaks were not allowed outside of lunch. I had one person admit to molesting his very small children and tell me he thought it was what they wanted. Had another confess to a brutal murder every grace and detail with a straight face. Another who would routinely dig up his mother's grave to put her in different clothes, and one who murdered his abuser. That job was nuts, and made me realize how you never really know anyone, or why they do anything. I was so burnt out I left the field altogether. It sucks because I know that's my calling, but I'm too old to go back to school for a master's now. I had a patient who was psychotic, and believed their ex-spouse had been molesting their child. This person went into graphic detail of examining the child's rectum for signs of abuse despite my attempts to get them to stop. I had to go to the door to my office and tell them they had to leave or I was going to call security. For the record, I never asked them about this either. Despite being aware of it from their crisis evaluation, I'm an activity therapist and my assessment with patients is all about their lifestyle and activity. I was asking them about chores, housework, ETC in their basic routine and this was apparently something they did multiple times a day. The auto is removed the child from their care. The patient eventually cleared from their psychosis, which was substance induced by mixing Adderall and alcohol, and recanted on their belief their spouse was molesting their child, but denied the examinations ever happened. I'm a therapist in training, in my last year of grad school for counseling, seeing clients. But my job before school was working on crisis lines, including the veterans crisis line. One evening I took a call from an older fellow who wanted to verbally process trauma, which is usually a no-go, because talking about trauma without any way to regulate the nervous system reinforces the neural pathways associated with the trauma and makes things worse. But this man could not persuade it to discuss current life stressors. He got himself into a flashback of time spent as a POW in Vietnam and described to me in graphic detail the horrors he endured, like what it was like to eat roaches and other bugs, to avoid starving to death and the torture he suffered, also went through his moral injuries of killing soldiers and a child accidentally, he then went on to say, that some time ago his wife and adult child died in an accident together, and he believed it was his punishment for what he did in the war, this went on for an hour, I offered as much support as I could, and tried to work with him to do any kind of self soothing, but he just kept on switching between processing shame slash guilt and processing trauma. I couldn't get his name, so I couldn't get him connected to the VAC contact for urgent mental health appointments, and he wasn't actively suicidal so there was nothing more I could do. The despair and resignation in his voice was haunting. Definitely hung up after that call and went straight to the bathroom and sobbed. I need dead many minutes. Easily the worst, most brutal call I ever took. I specialize in working with first responders and medical professionals, nurses, physicians, etc. The child death cases are always hard for me. I'm an expert at keeping a good poker face during those sessions, but damn if there aren't days I've gone home and just held my kids and cried with gratitude that it wasn't them. First responders experience so point much point trauma. Not a therapist. I worked at a VIP lounge near a conference center that hosted a few events every year for cops, child services, detectives, etc. One conference was specifically for how to handle crimes, where children are the victims slash targets. The cops would come in and have no tact. I was just a teen at that time with my own trauma making $8 slash HR no tips and these grown a men would drink and demand I listen to the worst of their cases like it was entertainment or typical office gossip. One told a horrible graphic story of two children who were abducted and abused. The oldest kid went to a therapist afterwards. 
the therapist didn't show up for her next client's appointment. They found her in the parking lot. It was probably just the last straw in a stack of many. But the way the cop told the story she heard the girl talk about what happened to her and her sister. Left the office and killed herself in her car. And honestly, I get it. It's been almost 12 years and I still have nightmares about those girls. I don't think you'll get many responses. I'm a teacher, used to teach in middle school, but now I transferred to high school. I want to share this, because I think my story is relevant. I was fresh out of college, barely even an adult myself, but I was assigned as a homeroom teacher to this class of mostly 13 to 14 yo. Kids, I had a student who would always excuse themselves to go to the bathroom and then self-harm. So we fellow teacher set up this monitoring scheme where, if we are on break we just supervise the hallway and check if there's anyone in the bathroom who stayed there for a suspiciously long time. The school did have a guidance counselor, but it's the home or room teacher's job to be the frontliner, so to speak. So I'd be the one counseling the kid and trying to get them to calm down, process their emotions, etc. I did not have any ounce of training for it, I just had to pull inward for mental strength and compassion, to be able to help the kid. Every after an incident I would break down, because I felt like everything was unfair, to me, because I didn't ask to be a therapist then, and to the kid, because they had to be counseled by a newbie teacher who just wanted to teach some physics. I think I wasn't the same ever since, I became very jaded of my profession. I'm still a teacher, I still love working with kids and teens, but I had to learn to harden my heart and realize that I can't help everyone because it's not my position to do so. I hated that thought and I still hate my powerlessness. The kid in my story eventually contacted me a few years after and told me that if I hadn't been there to listen, they might have just ended their life then. It made me feel like I did something right, but I wouldn't wish to go through that ever again. I worked as a therapist at a substance use agency before going into private practice. One of my biggest I need a moment times happened there. I was working with a young individual, and I myself was around their age, who was addicted to meth. They were bright, intelligent, and deeply empathetic to the world, but so so sick. Had to have not just one open heart surgeries due to cardiomyopathy, but two, prior to ever turning 30, just kept relapsing despite trying so hard. This client never missed treatment, didn't show for an appointment, so I called, didn't answer, they called back, and asked to speak to me. I will never forget the voice, when I answered, they were so broken, they had just relapsed before calling, and injected meth into their PICC line that was treating another heart infection. They were so afraid and disappointed, I remember thinking, that their addiction was going to kill them, and it weighed so heavily on me, I will never forget this client, after that call I sat there awash in the realization, that my clients would likely die from this, and they were my age, addiction can turn people all out of character, but they were so sweet and kind, would give you the shirt off their back, I truly believe they were just too kind for this harsh world, but, this was a while ago, client went to a higher level of care, and I found out over a year later they were sober, and doing well, and had moved states. I remember crying, when I found out they made it all that time later. It's my work with kids that has always affected me most. Had one kid that was in foster care, and had been pushed from house to house, he had apparently had a very rough upbringing before that. He was very quiet, and didn't talk much. We always gave every child a box that they could decorate and fill with things they made in sessions. At the end of their sessions they could then take it home if they wanted to. What did this kid do when I first gave him his box? He started making it into a house, gave it a door, windows, a roof etc. And then wrote a message to his mum, who he couldn't see anymore, on the side to say that he loved her. In the sessions he spent the majority of the time playing with the dollhouse where it always went the same way. He arranged all the furniture and people perfectly. He was very specific about what went where and what people had which rooms. And then he would destroy it all, saying that the new people are coming. I have a lot of stories, but remembering his pain and his simple desire for a home always breaks my heart.